those two or three pages. And what I was trying to show there was that as the 19th century drew to a close, the artists who were prominent in the 19th century were all tragic figures. The 19th century, as you know, was a century of material progress, enlightenment, and rationalism, and so on. <clears throat> Yet, the artists who uh, have all become famous in that period are really all against that very thing. So they were all being crucified. I don't know how many of them meet early deaths, do you see? Uh, die horrible deaths. They are denied, they're denigrated, they're persecuted. Nietzsche ends up in the asylum, you see. Van Gogh and Rambeau both die within a year of each other at the ages of 34, do you see? Well, I don't, I don't, I have to go through the catalog. It's a whole uh, history or a, uh, a catalog of disaster. And yet all these men are filled with a vision of something better to come, do you know? Wait a minute, Henry, I gotta stop you here. Yes. You picked out six or eight names. Why do well, you pick the tortured spirits instead of the solid and complete spirits? Because it was the tortured spirits who reflect the spirit, I think. It was the spirit that was being tortured in that century, precisely that. You hit the crux of it in my mind, do you see? Uh, the others, represent, you might say, the status quo, the trend, the trend toward nowhere, so to speak, which is the usual trend. And the others are the afflicted ones. And the afflicted ones are always afflicted because they're trying to preserve something, maintain something that is uh, vital to us, that lifts us up, that keeps us and nourishes us, don't you know? I say, yes, you take take Blake. Well, he, he, he began in the 18th, he moves into the night. He's at the very threshold, don't you know? Very great figure, prophetic figure, huh? an enigmatic one, very big in the realm of poetry, you know, and philosophy, if you like, or religion. Yes, yeah, great, great figure. And you have Nietzsche, you know, in the middle again, do you see? Then you have crazy men like Strindberg, then you have a, even that fairly sane man, Ibsen. Look at his dramas, what revolt, what a uh, castigation of society you have there, don't you know? Isn't that so? It shows you the, the modern world falling apart. Its dilemmas are uh, petty dilemmas, so to speak, don't you know? Huh? Henry, how do you explain the fact that a uh, that a man of our generation, and we are contemporaries, as we sit across this table. Uh, Henry, how do you explain this choice in this 19th century of these special figures? What is so modern about them? Why do they appeal to modern man, do you think? I mean, what is the link between the names that you pick out, Blake and Ibsen, Nietzsche. Nietzsche and others. Uh, in other words, what, what do you think appeals to modern man in these figures who are not modern? I think it, that, they, um, that they represent in their work or they delineate his peculiar tragedy, that they previsioned it. They foresaw what was happening to the world and to man. Uh, I think it's it's primarily that. Uh, the others are depicting life around them, as every artist can always do. It's a, uh, a petty labor of every day, this descriptive thing, you know, of recounting what is happening before your eyes. But the other men probe deeper and um, get to the real uh, crooks of man's problems. Primarily it was that man in the 19th century began to feel a loneliness which we do not know about, at least as I read history, I have never read it before, 
of a loneliness so great as the modern man feels. He has been feeling it for a century now, and he's getting more and more lonely, more and more atomized, as it were, do you see? He's, um, he's been blown apart, you might say. He's lost. He's in a world where he has no bearings. He's on his own. That's another before, either. Because in the past, he had tradition. He had convention. He had uh, God and church, you know. He had an organized uh, society, quite strong. There were castes, there were grades, and so on. Today, all that is gone, you see. And a man has to save himself. There are no longer any intermediaries. There are no intercessors. A man, there is nothing on the horizon today as there were in other perilous times. Great leaders who might lead man like a Moses out of the wilderness, a leader like a Christ. We have had a Gandhi, it is true, it is true. This is in India. India is still quite a different world than this one we're living in, this modern world. It still has more of the aura of the spiritual uh, connected with it, huh? and it is linked closer still with the past. But we have broken all those ties, do you see? And now it's man naked before the world, as I see it, you see? And it, it's up to him to save himself. He can no longer look to anyone else for help. Each man must save himself. That is what I think is both the desperate quality and the excellent quality about this modern age. This great problem, the great challenge, in other words, do you see? Man has got to recognize himself as somebody, as a being, something more than just what we call a human being, or go down or perish. He has no other uh, supports, as it were. Nothing is holding him up. He's alone, each one alone in the world. Well, this is how I interpret it, Ben. The situation, the drama. Mm. In other words, if I, uh, now I risk going a little more philosophic with you, but actually, it's been said time and again by various people, strange people perhaps, uh, there will never be again a savior for man. There, we have had enough saviors. Uh, we've had an end of saviors. Uh, they have done all that is possible. They have shown man the way. Now man must find it for himself on his own, do you see? He cannot be saved anymore. He must save himself. Well, this is a great thing, a big thing. And I think ultimately it's a good thing. Then you don't really mean man's tragic position, because that's the word you use. Well, it is tragic in the sense that it's profoundly uh, weighted with the good and bad, you see. There is the balance, there's the risk, there's the challenge. You know, it's... Uh, Live or perish, uh, and live, I mean by that, up to your maximum, you see. We can't live anymore on this, uh, shall I say, mediocre scale on which we've been living. We can't live just believing and hoping and worshiping. That's something more, I mean. Now we have to be really imbued with the faith to a degree that we act upon it. It's been too long, the whole history of the world, the religious history, to my mind, has been the history of man living on crutches. Now we're throwing those crutches away. You have a chance to deny that there is such a thing as a God and justice and beauty and so on in the world, or to accept it fully and make this world all that the great ones in the past have promised us it is or would be, do you see? And it's not in the sky in tomorrow, in the hereafter, but it's right now that it should be done and can be done. That's the thing. <laughs>